Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Soccer Cowboy Church. You. All right. I can see the enthusiasm is everywhere tonight. You're glad to be out. You're just glad to be anywhere, aren't you? Yeah, amen. Okay. Well, I wish I had some good news to tell you, but it's uh, all about the Lord, and that's good. Let's sing. You want to sing? Now, tonight you're going to have to sing real good, real pretty. What, you, what number are you going to do? Well, we're going to start with a, a God Bless America. Oh, we're going to start with God Bless America for the 4th of July weekend. Yeah. You want everybody to stand, and how are we going to do no. this? No. no, okay, just sing. <laughs> <clears throat> I see them toppling. If they were to stand, I would see them. Yeah, let's just let's just sing. God bless America. God. Whoa. Back up a little bit. Remember that I was gonna do a little thing. I didn't, but I do now. When the storm clouds gather far across the sea. Let us pledge allegiance to a land once free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our God bless America. to heaven yeah number 72 let's sing when we all get to heaven let's sing while we're down here too sing the wondrous love of jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed be Of 
rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Well, you did good. Don, come up and talk to us a little bit. Howdy, y'all. Hey, uh, Band of Brothers will be start meeting the, uh, July the 12th out at the event center uh, at 6 o'clock. Circle Sisters are going to start meeting on the 6th of uh, January. Yeah. I, I put that off just a little way. How about July? How about, they're going to meet. So I'm just seeing if you guys are listening. You don't always listen to me. Uh, dancing, the line dancing practice, well, they're from 4 to 5.30 at the event center on Mondays. Uh, be glad if you good exercise to get out there, you know. I find it ironic that the red, white, and blue stands for freedom, except in your rear view mirror. <laughs> well, that's deep, isn't it? <laughs> Mary, what have you done? John, how about leading us in a prayer to start our service off today? going to sing turn your radio on huh i always think this is curious for the song is turn your radio on and it's uh, 65 uh, the i loved it in the sunday morning especially in the third service when we have the youngest of the crowd there and we sing turn your radio on i'm th they're all sitting there thinking what's a radio is that what's in the car <laughs> okay back in the old days this is how we spend our evenings Come and listen in to a radio station where the mighty hosts of heaven sing. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you want to hear the songs of Zion coming from the land of endless springs in touch with God, turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Oh, yes, turn your radio and on. Listen to the and music listen to the music. The turn your radio on. Oh, yes, turn your radio on. the glory on. share. Heaven's glory share. Turn your lights down low. Oh, yes, turn your lights down low. And listen to the, master's, listen to the master's radio. Get in touch with God. Turn, turn your radio on. Very play the piano. Listen in to the glory land chorus. Listen to the glad hosannas roll. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Get a little taste of joy the waiting. Get a little heaven in your soul. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. Get in touch with 
with God. Turn your radio on. turn it on huh all right here's another old willie nelson song number 61 now somebody don't have to do a willie nelson impersonation <laughs> anybody want to try that <laughs> just sing just sing you know. <laughs> oh willie loves this song i like this song too number 61 unclouded day specials doing good. oh well yeah why not okay. i'm gonna turn it over to my brother oh. <laughs> he does special come on gary
I, I can sing a little, but I kind of stop singing uh, the moment Scotty starts. And so uh, we used to do, of course, a lot of quartet music and that type of thing. And uh, when he'd come around to solos, they'd say, Gary, take it. I said, no, Scott, you got it. And uh, I just can't compete with that, you know, and I stopped trying years ago. Well, just a point of uh, trivia, not that it is worth anything to anybody, but uh, <clears throat> talked about Willie Nelson. I have a family story in, about Willie. Uh, Beverly, as a, my wife, as a little girl, uh, her parents lived in Fort Worth, Texas, and her grandparents lived in Fort Worth, Texas. And, well, they lived around, and interestingly enough, her grandfather was a Baptist preacher, and her grandmother was a Methodist preacher, Pentecostal preacher. Yeah, they were both preachers. Now, how, how did that work? I don't have a clue. And uh, it's probably pretty rough. <clears throat> but her grandfather had a recording studio. It was one of the first maybe in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, Beverly remembers in his studio, he had all the walls covered in egg cartons, you know, so it would absorb the sound. It was one of the first sound absorption kind of material that they had and Beverly used to go in as a little girl and punch all the egg and, and uh, poke them in there but there was a guy who came in one day and he re my her grandfather recorded all kinds of people sons of the pioneers daughters of the whatever and a lot of groups back then would come and he would record them I, uh, one day a young man came in and uh, talked to our grandfather and said he'd like to record uh, an album and uh, his grandfather said her grandfather said well let's let's give it a listen and see how it goes and and we'll see if we can record this thing and this young man started singing and evidently her grandfather stopped in mid-song and said don't ever sing again in your life this is horrible it was Willie Nelson <laughs> believe it or not <clears throat> she turned him he turned him away <laughs> And I don't know, he could have probably made a lot of money from that one. But anyway, trivia. I don't know how that relates to Nehemiah. I don't give, have a clue. But anyway, uh, let's turn to Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, if you would. And we've got another, my wife asked, how long are you going to do this? And I'm sure some of you are thinking, how long <laughs> are we going to do Nehemiah? Probably maybe one more, one more evening, unless I get inspired to do something else <clears throat> and uh, here in Nehemiah 9 uh, just to kind of begin that I've kind of observed over the years that many people come to Jesus to receive his salvation only to kind of get stuck and I don't know whether this relates to any of you or not but getting stuck in a rut is is an interesting not a really good place to be uh, someone said a rut is a grave with the ends kicked out of it. And, you know, that's kind of it because in a place, if you're not moving forward and you get stuck, you're, you're really probably moving backwards in your faith. You know, some people come to Jesus, and I don't know, I've thought about this very often, why did I want to come to Jesus when I did as a younger man? Uh, I, you know, I was afraid of eternity in a bit without Jesus and I, I fear is not a, a good motivator I understand that but there there was that uh, thing and it, it boiled down to well I need a fire insured insurance policy I don't want to burn I do want to go to heaven and I knew that was the right thing to do but fear was motivating me some in that and I'm so thankful that even though I came to Jesus with some fear in my heart about that that he began a process in me of discipleship and over the years, that, that childlike faith turned into a more discipled adult faith, you know, and I think some do that. Some are uh, a bit scared of the future. Some have near-death experiences, uh, and some just do it because that's what the family does. Those are reasons, but I'm not sure it's the best reason. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what we catch uh, as we've gone to church that we just need a fire insurance policy come to Jesus and everything's going to be rosy from this point on just get in and you're okay do your own thing after you get saved and it'll be okay well 
I, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I believe once you're in, you're in, and I'm not going there. But there is a process, I believe, after we come into the kingdom of God to begin a process of growth and discipleship. That's the appropriate thing that God really wants for us. So we begin with salvation, and we continue through Bible study, through listening, through preaching, through teaching, through prayer, through all kinds of personal things that we do with, with God. We grow, and we, we grow in our faith. We, we get more established. We have, we have joy that comes from that. We have faith that starts developing in that process. So it is a process, and I, I just want to throw that out here to you tonight. And so in Nehemiah 9, we've, we've just gone through a period with Nehemiah where he caught a vision to restore Jerusalem to its, to its wonderful place that it was at one point. Ezra and, and others before him, they'd built the temple. Uh, Nehemiah saw that the walls were torn down, the gates were burned, it was in disrepair. He got a vision from God, a burden from God. He called on the people. They jumped in and started building and did all these wonderful things. King Artaxerxes gave him the resources that he needed to build the wall, gave him permission to go do that. He could, he could get timber from the forest, he get rocks from the quarries, and it was wonderful. The, the people responded to the vision. And there was constant, we talked about that a couple of weeks, constant opposition internally within the people, externally from people outside just trying to get them to stop. And I don't understand why. They just didn't want to see God, God's work expand. And there's always the detractors, always, as we move forward. <clears throat> and after 52 days, the walls were completed, 52 days of incredibly hard work. And now Ezra came, we talked last week, and came and helped Nehemiah, and they had this incredible uh, event that started there. Uh, the people were weeping. The, the word was read. The, the law had been read. The people caught a huge conviction and burden. They had been dispersed, and now they were starting to come back into Jerusalem, into Israel. Uh, uh, the dispersion, they were brought back. Some of the Jews even bought some of those people back from slavery and brought them back home. It was a wonderful time. And the walls were completed. Now they were saved. The victory had been won. The completion of the walls had been done. And so my question is with them now, what do they do? What do we do now? What do we do now once we're saved? What do we do now once we have begun the process? Well, it is a, is a constant thing. And I think we'll see here in Nehemiah uh, some pointers, I think, for all of us as we walk through this. Pointers for ourselves how to continue in our walk with God. Uh, let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9, if you would, with me. I kind of call this, uh, one of the points is we need to have a continuous, we need to continuously receive our cleansing. Yes, we get saved and God forgives us, absolutely, and he eradicates our past and brings forgiveness and cleansing in the moment, in that moment. Now, the next step I take, I may blow it, and I don't lose my salvation, but I do lose some of the joy and, and some things start happening in me once I begin blowing it. We need a continual cleansing of our lives as we walk forward, so... Nehemiah says, now on the 24th day of the month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sack. <clears throat> Man, my voice is changing. I'm just going through puberty. This is good news. <clears throat> where, where did that come from? <clears throat> is there an old age puberty? I don't know. No, I won't go there. Uh, I've lost my train of thought totally. <laughs> now on the 24th, I'll start again. Now on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting, almost did it again, in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. Interesting thought here. And the descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. Wow, okay. So they had just come out of a real powerful time of victory. The walls were completed. They got to rest. They got to eat some biscuits and gravy for a change at breakfast. 
got to be with the family and the grandkids. And now all of a sudden, it wasn't enough. God had not finished with them yet. And, uh, you know, there's that, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. I forget the, how that works. But that's so true for all of us. And there has to be a patience for us. But there needs to be a growth process. And it says in Nehemiah eight seventeen, it says, There was great rejoicing when they had completed that task. And, you know, I remember Mom and I were just talking, uh, Dad, passed nine years ago yesterday. I was just thinking back and reminiscing in my mind a bit whenever I broke into their bedroom one night at midnight or 1 o'clock, I don't know, scared the socks off of them and told them I needed to get saved, and uh, I said, you got to pray with me, and so I, they got out of bed, and we prayed, and I just remembered after that process, after going through praying and trying to wrestle with God to find peace in my heart, it finally came, and I, there was just in me just the greatest sense of relief and release and joy, that, that I, that's indescribable. I remember telling mom and dad, I, said, I, was, I was laying back on the bed, and I, I can remember this as it were yesterday. I said, I think I'm going to float off of this bed. I said that because the weight, the pressure of where I had been, and I, I don't think I was a horrible sinner, but there was a weight in me that was lifted, and there was great rejoicing. There was great rejoicing in the city whenever the walls were completed, and this task was done. Uh, and so they had to remember. The, the people's sin, if you recall, in, in chapter 8 was really heavy on them. In fact, they were weeping. The people were weeping and mourning when the word of God was being, was being spoken to them. Isn't that incredible? That it was not just the read. They, they read from morning till, I think it was till noon almost that day. And there was such conviction. I don't. There, there are moments of conviction for all of us. And guess what? Once we're saved, conviction will will continue to happen periodically. And you say, "Don't." I don't want you to dread that. We should rejoice in the fact that God does convict us when He wants us to change something in the future. Not that we've lost our salvation, but yet He wants us to move us along into discipleship, into further growth. And so they were mourning, and, and uh, <laughs> Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites said in, chap in chapter 8, verse 9, they said, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not weep or mourn. He stopped the weeping. He stopped the mourning. And it was time here for re rejoicing. So now he's moving God, really, through Nehemiah and Ezra and others, are moving the people after the victory, after the physical labor, then he starts working on the spiritual life of the, the people coming back. The, many of the, the Jews that came back had been compromised in their faith. They had adopted some of the gods and some of the rules and practices of the people where they were taken into captivity that married women of those races, and it was against God's rule and law at that point to do that and so they they had misplaced and and lost really the the depth of the religion of the jews and and nehemiah and ezra now was calling them back spiritually and it's kind of like us we many of many of us have been in the world and and god calls us out of that to come back into a place of of covenant with him once again so we see that we receive constant cleansing, and this cleansing involves a few things, and we'll find it here in, in, uh, as we continue. As we read here, Nehemiah takes this vigorous and intense measure to remove some of the social and religious evils from the people. I mean, he got serious with the people because they were not living as, as he thought they should, and really as they, they really shouldn't have. He, thought, he saw things that threatened the character and really the prosperity of the chosen people of God. And he saw that, and you see, that's part of what the preacher, the prophet does. They call people to come back to their relationship with God himself. 
These are the, the, some of the things that were happening. They were mingling God's chosen holy race with the neighboring lands. And he called this practice detestable here in Nehemiah. They had intermingled the holy seed of God, the chosen race, the pure people of God, with things of the world. They compromised is exactly what they had done. And I, I thought about that. They had, they had sold their children into slavery. And one of the reasons they sold their children, even as they'd come back to Jerusalem, because they didn't have any money. And a famine was in the land, and they were hungry. And so they would sell their children to another person to work for them so that they could eat. It was a, they had been in slavery and freed from it, and now they were re-enslaving some of their own. They had adopted some of the religion of the places they were, where they were dis dispersed. And uh, Nehemiah calls them back now to consecrate themselves before holy God, to separate themselves and become the people of God, the chosen race that he had called them to be. Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra really meant business with the people here. And they chose to humble themselves before God. Uh, they consecrated themselves to God. So what does this humility look like? Well, the first thing they did was fast. They withdrew from eating food for a period of time. Uh, sometimes uh, I think the Jews would even uh, fast water for a period of time. Jesus, you remember in the desert when he was tempted, he went 40 days. He fasted for 40 days. Uh, I have never fasted 40 days. I've done a few fasts, but nothing like that. Uh, hunger is, is tough to deal with when you're fasting. But fasting is really separating yourself from things that you enjoy, maybe for a period of time, to seek God instead. And it's not regulated. It's encouraged. In fact, my wife and I read a book one time, Fasting Will Save Your Life. Well, I, I think I need to do that more than not. You know, if I lose a few pounds, that might help. And fasting does that. But fasting primarily is a humility of saying, I'm not going to eat for a period of time in view of seeking God and getting to know him a bit better. <clears throat> there was this also an outward de debasement that, that we see here. And I, I can't get, quite get my head around it. I've done some research on it. An outward physical picture of what was going on in inwardly is this. They put on sackcloth and they sprinkled dirt all over them. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's a self-humiliation, I suppose. It's to reveal something that they want internally and they express that in an external way. Now, we do this. We do this. Not, we don't. We don't change our clothes and tear parts of our clothing and put dirt on ourselves and come to church. We, I've never seen that. You might try it. I, I suspect, suspect some of our people guarding the doors might uh, ask you to maybe not come in. They might check you for something else. I don't know. <clears throat> but they would put dirt on themselves. It was a form of outward. It was a picture of what was going on internally with them. We do this too. You know, when we pray, what do we do with our hats? We have an external. Now, does it help us pray to take our hats off before we pray? It doesn't help us pray. It's just an outward expression of what I want to do internally. I want to humble myself before holy God when I talk to him. It's okay. It's just an external picture of what we do internally. Sometimes uh, when God is in a place, and I've seen it here and I've done it myself, when, when you're feeling the movement of God, sometimes I've worshipped him with, I raise my hands, you know? Now, is that something that I want just to be seen? Absolutely not. It's an expression of something that goes on deep inside of me, that it wells up in me and I, I'm, I'm wanting to love God so much that it's just good. I just say, oh, God, I love you. It's, a, it's an outward expression of what is going on internally within me. You know, we clap our hands to express, to appreciate really what God is doing around us. So it's okay. To, all these things are okay. 
sometimes when we really get serious with God and we need him pretty desperately, what do we do? We sometimes crawl out of bed and we get on our knees. Now, does that get us closer to God? I would think maybe no, because God is probably up. Well, we think he is. And if I go low, but no, it's a sense of humility. It's a sense of saying, God, I want to get low so you can get high. See, John the Baptist did that. He said, I want to decrease so that you can increase. So we do things outwardly that express something deeply internal for us. Those are good things. Those are okay things. And, uh, and I, I would never debunk that. And I think it's okay. But in their practice, to show us form of humility, they would tear their clothing. They would put on sackcloth. I'm not sure what that sackcloth is. But they would sometimes tear their clothing. They would cover, cover themselves with dust. And it was just an outward indication. So it was a it was a period, it was just a point of hum, humbling themselves before God. In fact, that's a good thing, isn't it? The Bible says, humble yourself before God and he will, he will raise you up. He will exalt you. And sometimes in prayers, so why do we close our eyes as we pray? Now, does that make you more closer to God or more holy? No, not really. Uh, we do it because it's a sign I'm humbling myself before God. I even taught my people in Scotland when we were on the streets, don't close your eyes when you pray. They, many people had horrible time doing that because we wanted them to be looking around and being sure we were safe when we were in the streets. So we had them pray with people when they were had their eyes open. So it, it's okay. <clears throat> I've even been, been in some services where people get happy and start shouting. You ever been in a shouting service? <laughs> uh do I? Yeah, I've been around and we, uh, somebody gave me a picture. Who was that gave me a picture of my Uncle Sam Killingsworth? Somebody, were you, were you here? Handed me a, uh, an article in 1945 of my Uncle Sam Killingsworth. And my dad remembers, I've told you the story, but he remembers him at Kelly Church out by Astro Walnut Grove. And dad could remember Uncle Sam coming up through, he lived in Phoenix, so he walked all the way from Phoenix to Kelly Church. And Dad said they, as kids, they would stand outside and wait for Uncle Sam because they could hear him coming. He was shouting and praising God as he came up, came up to church. Those are all good things. These are just external demonstrations for us of what is going on deep inside our heart. And let that happen. You know, sometimes if, if I'm a, uh, I don't know, if I, if I get too proud and, you know, the moment I fall on my knees, there's something that breaks inside of me. Now, I don't do that publicly, but I do do that privately. And when I do fall on my knees, it's, it breaks something inside of me. It breaks my pride. It, breaks, it, it causes humility. All those things are good. But the bottom line is there needs to be a consecration of our life, a continual cleansing through practice after we have gotten saved so we can become more mature and developed in the things of God. Another step of this cleansing for the, for the Israelites was separation, we read here. And the descendants of Israel had separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Uh, that's a tough one. There was a need to disassociate with things that cause them to backtrack with their God. Well, that's a good one for us. You know, I've told my children, and oh, I, how often, with eight, I've told, I've told them often. I said, and my mom would do the same. You know, Dad would tell me, don't date someone that you're not willing to get married to, right? And I always thought, well, that's kind of, but that's right, Mom, that's right. And that's what we, we should be thinking in terms of that because we don't need to connect ourselves with people that will draw us down. The uh, Proverbs even talks about uh, relating and fellowshipping with fools. We shouldn't do that. There are times of separation. And God was calling the people of Israel to separate from the foreigners. They had become really attached to the whole issue of those they were with. 
And now God is calling them back to become now the holy people of God, the consecrated ones. And he's calling them here to do that. Now, they also confess their sins. A few weeks back, I talked about the sins of the fathers. And uh, it's really important that we pray through some things because we, we have come generationally to where we are today. And some of the sins of our grandparents and our parents and, and genetically have come to us. And they predispose us to certain things. You could look at, in some, in some houses, alcoholism comes down line after line after line into the house. And it just seems like that's hard to break. Those are generational sins. And I think we can, as a people of God, separate ourselves from those and come before God in a place and say, God, I, I, I understand that this is a generational thing. I'm tempted with that. And I want to lay an ax to the root of this tree in my life and in my children's life for the future. And we can do that in prayer. There's, there is a separation. So they, they had disassociated themselves from people who are not of God. They didn't, Nehemiah didn't want them to sink to the level of sin that, that, uh, with the, those people or even be associated with them. So there was a separation here. They must also here separate from good events and activities that did not produce the best in the people of God. That's a hard one. I've been uh, really concerned about our current culture. I don't know about you. Current generation, uh, X or Zs, and uh, it just seems like they've lost some of the ethics and some of the principles and even some of the work ethics that, that we, in my generation, man, I was taught to work hard. And that's all I've ever known. And many of you have done the same thing. That's what we do. We've been taught to work hard. Some of the, the, the generation coming along have lost some of that, those things, even, even lost the desire sometimes to even seek after God. They're turning away from church right, left, and center because they don't think it's re relevant these days. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a getting mentality, isn't it, rather than a giving mentality. And Boy, that's totally different from my generation uh, here. Uh, and we need to pray, really, for this, our, our children and our children's children. Uh, and I think we can do that and change some things down the road. And for you young people that are here, let's get, I just call you back to a really place of God, a stable place in Him. So there was also... After the confession, there was a work of the word of God here. Look at verse 3. It says they stood where they were. They were actually at the water gate here. And I, I kind of in my mind pictured this. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Uh, there was true confession, and we need to notice that. And true confession turns, turns us. True confession will cause repentance. And repentance is basically moving in one direction and turning and walking in another, never to return to that place that we were walking in. That's what repentance is about. It's not getting in an altar someplace and crying our eyes out. It's understanding God's law. I've broken it, and I don't want to go that direction any further. I repent of that and confess my sin, and I turn with the grace of God and walk from that and walk in a new way. That's, that's what that's all about. So the word of God here was breaking the, the hardness, breaking the hardness of their hearts. It says they spent another quarter in confession. I think this was out loud confession before people. And in worshiping the Lord their God. They confess the sins of their ancestors. They confess their own sins. We'll look at it just in a moment. There, there, here's a four-part prayer. And we'll look at uh, that in just a bit. And they worship the Lord. Look at verse 4 of chapter 9 here. Now, I just got a picture of this. They're at the water gate. Uh, the gate around the temple. They had been repaired. New, new gates were put up. It's called the water gate, and I'm sure there's water there. There were stairs. I don't know why the writer puts this in here, but it says, standing on the stairs. I just get a picture of that, you know. See, they're just 
Stairs coming down in the water gate. People are standing up there. Were Yeshua, this is not Jesus, just the name of a Hebrew, Bani, Kadmiel, Shibana, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kaniah. And they says they cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. Can you get the picture? Uh, they've been people have been praying and confessing sin and worshiping God, and now the stair people start yelling out praises to their God. They're they're calling out, and they even named the people that were doing it. And the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Peth I can't say this one. Peth Pethahiah said that sounds like an Indian name, doesn't it? Pethahiah said they now these people said stand up now they're cheerleaders <laughs> they've got the whole crew around here they've been confessing and worshiping God and now these people that are named they started shouting stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting well I just sent cold chills up my back had I been there and you have a whole group of people start shouting at the top of their their lungs come on people come on praise god with with a loud voice stand up and praise the lord he's from everlasting to everlasting what a beautiful place of worship i'd love to have been there i i don't know it just it feels like a, a good place to be at that moment worship leader cheerleaders worship cheerleaders here in this place and then <clears throat> this we won't read it tonight. I really thought about doing it, but it's actually about 28 verses. It's probably the, one of the longest prayers in the whole of the Word of God. And it's fabulous and beautiful. It's almost the whole ninth chapter is a prayer. It's four-dimensional. I'll just run over these real quickly. The prayer is four-dimensional. They looked up, there's one dimension, in adoration and praise and worship that was the first one and boy that's we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise that's how god wants us to worship so when we come to prayer when we come to church worship is a vital wonderful place for us to be and here it's the first dimension the vertical dimension adoration and prayer you if you'll read the the prayer that's where they started with adoration and praise to holy god secondly they looked back they reflected on their past with thanksgiving they rehearsed where god had led them time and time and time again they had built altars way back in history remember we when we crossed the, the jordan they took rocks out they put rocks there remember remember and so they remembered what God had done historically in the nation and in themselves. So there was this picture of thanksgiving because God had led them. And look, as you look back in that second dimension of prayer, that helps us today. Because when I look back in my life, I can see the hand of God time after time after time. When I didn't see him at the moment, I now look back and say, yes, that was God. He led me here. He, even when Scott ran over me with a tractor, and he did. You know, I look back, and I should be dead. It was about 12, and a big tractor started here and went right up over my shoulder with the back wheel. Uh, I didn't have any broken bones and lived. And I don't know how that worked, but God had a plan. I look back, and I could say God had a reason for me to be alive today he didn't want me dead at that moment so i lived beyond that mom's shaking her head up there that's only half of it isn't it mom <laughs> that went on so we look up we look back in reflection and thanksgiving we look inward and that's what they did here with confession with understanding saying god uh, reveal my heart to myself because i can't really see it and when conviction comes, there's that confession and healing that comes as we look internally. I don't encourage us to look very deeply internally. The Holy Spirit's good at this. So I, I thought at a time, you know, I'm going to start trying to chase down 
in me some of my problems. And I can't tell you what, I can't, I can't find the end of those. And I got to the end of it, and I said, I can't do this any longer. Jesus, you have to deal with me and all of that stuff within me. And as we allow him, he will. He'll come and begin working on our past and on the things that are within us and bring us to a place of covenant with him again, even after we've gotten saved. So that's what's happening here. And the fourth thing, they looked ahead. God gives vision for the people, direction and commitment for the future. So read that prayer sometime. I, it's, a, it's a really beautiful prayer. So he did that. And also the people of God, in this prayer, one of the things, there, there really are three things here that I pulled out. He allowed them to see who they were, their position with God, their identity. Who were they? And I think we need to constantly, and this is a good thing, reassess our identity and our position with God. Our identity is vital to going on with God. Who are you anyway? Who are you? Are you a cupbearer like Nehemiah? Are you a preacher? And there's no, so much more. I, I have a sheet that I keep in most of my notes. It's about 50 statements in the scripture of who I am in Christ. Here's a few. I'm chosen of God. I've been chosen by him. I'm precious and wonderfully made. I, that feels weird to even say that, but it's true. It's true. I'm a servant of the Most High God. That's what Scripture says about me and you. I'm appointed by God, and so are you. I am separated unto him. I'm precious in his sight. I have died with him in his death. My old man has been crucified with him. In Romans, it says that. I have, in Romans, it says, I've been buried with him. When Jesus was put, put in the tomb, in some incredible way, I was on the cross with him. And in some spiritual, powerful way, I was put into the grave with him. And I was also resurrected with him to newness of life in his resurrection. Romans talks about this. Now, how I get my head around that, I don't know. But it's very true. And if we start living in resurrection, life and power... That's where that comes from. And now, if it's true, and it is, I'm now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I'm right here at Cowboy Church smelling the cattle poo. And no, the Bible says I'm now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. If I love the Father... Jesus is here. Where am I? I'm in Jesus, and my father, daddy, is right here. I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's my position. That gives us worth. That gives us identity. Now, I don't know how you get your head around that. I have trouble, but it's true anyway. So our position, who we are, our identity is important. Our past, where have we been? We shouldn't live in the past, but we now need to have a new future. And that's what salvation does for us. He sets us apart and now positions us for something new and fresh in the future. As long as you breathe, vision is ahead for you. And God wants you to have that. So where are we going? Nehemiah's goal was at the height, was not the height or the width of the wall. That was a beautiful thing. Nehemiah's glory was the glory of God himself. Nehemiah lived so that God would have all the glory. should be our destination also. So Satan will tempt us to give up, to retreat, to refrain from going on with God. When this happens, we must persevere and overcome that. We have a crown awaiting us. We have hope and a future. And then the last thing I just want to say is in verse 38. After the prayer, there, and we'll talk about it next week, they, they have a binding agreement, a covenant. And this is a powerful covenant that they were making. Verse 38, in view of all of this, it says, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing 
and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. Now, we'll look next week. It just didn't stop there. And we'll talk about the agreement. They covenanted with their God in writing. <laughs> God doesn't need it written down, but they needed it written down. A binding covenant. Did this go out? It's, uh, anyway, a binding covenant with God. We'll look at it next week. But there was the wheels and the woes. The curse, they, they actually called a curse down upon themselves if they didn't obey this covenant. And they also commanded the blessing that was there. We'll look at that also next week. <clears throat> so what do we do? We never stop keeping on. I, there was a preacher I remember uh, that would always say, you just need to keep on keeping on, keep on keeping on. There's no place to stop. I've seen people stop. It's not a pretty place. And with God, he wants us to keep on the process of discipleship, growth, and maturity. So we see this in Nehemiah. After the completion of the walls, we now see, okay, let's deal with the spiritual. Sure, we've got victory. Now let's keep on developing a relationship with God. Okay, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you for <clears throat> the word of God. The Old Testament even is, is a picture or is beautiful things for us to learn from. So, Father, help us as a people, as a church, to keep on keeping on, just to press on to know you, to know you as best we can the rest of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 57. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus the Lord. The sweeter he grows, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart over. Flows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Can anybody say amen to that tonight? The longer you serve him. Gary, did you know, where are you, Gary? Did you know that the guy that said that long, the, the keep on keeping on, his grandson is sitting up here on the back row? Danny Slatton, it's Danny's, Danny's granddad and uh, old Joy. He would say that, just keep on keeping on, yeah. And um, I, I don't know, should I be sorry for running over Gary with the tractor? I don't know. <laughs> it, was, it was a farming accident. It wasn't on purpose, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just once. I didn't back up. <laughs> That's good, Don. Thanks, guys, for being here tonight. Appreciate your blessings on you. Let's go out back into our world and, and take the things that we've learned here and apply them out there. Amen. Let me pray and bless us. Father, take us home safely. Let us be about the master's business, like putting you first in everything. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a good 4th of July. Or we'll see you here at church on the 5th.